Hello, everyone, and greetings from Augsburg, Germany. I was not really sure if I should say warm greetings because we had a little bit of snow today over here, so I will just stick with the normal greetings. <laughs> so perhaps I can share the uh, screen with my presentation. So I will also switch off the camera for a while so that we could focus uh, on the presentation. So uh, today we are going to talk about uh, a topic that is relevant for many organizations, and that is the protection of the sensitive data with encryption while working remotely, a situation which I believe is pretty familiar to uh, many organizations um, on an international base. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Elizabeth. And since six years ago, I am uh, part of the Boxcryptor team. Uh, Secomba uh, GmbH is the name of our company, but you might know us a little bit better from the uh, product called Boxcryptor. As a short introduction uh, for us, uh, Secomba is on the market since 2011, uh, when our founders came up with a solution which helped them to secure the data in the cloud. So we will be celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. Our entire team is based in Augsburg, Germany, which is close to Munich as an orientation point, and it consists of around 30 people who are all highly passionate about uh, cybersecurity and data protection as well. All of our servers are located in a German data center, which is ISO certified and managed by the EU governance and compliance requirements. Um, as a short introduction about Boxcryptor, if you haven't heard about it, uh, it's being used by companies and organizations from all over the world from various sizes, um, from startups up to large enterprises and universities as well. The main use case is to protect the sensitive data that is kept in the cloud away from prying eyes. As a matter of state, uh, when uh, the companies come to realize when should they implement an encryption solution, it's actually different as some of them come to us uh, as a preventive method. And uh, unfortunately, some of them come to us uh, after a breach has happened so that it wouldn't uh, happen again in future. Okay, so let's start. Uh, I would uh, give an example with um, our own um, experience. Uh, so for our own team, it's been already a year since um, the first lockdown has been announced here in Germany and we've started working uh, remotely. So more or less, we're already celebrating the first uh, anniversary of the remote work. Uh, I can say that the switch from the office setup uh, to the home setup was executed pretty fast because as an IT company, we had the necessary equipment in terms of hardware and software as well as the experience of working remotely now and then before the lockdown. So it was definitely a smooth uh, process for all of us. However, for many companies out there, this transition had to be done urgent and with a lot of stress. This is the feedback that uh, many CISOs were sharing with us in our conversations last year. In fact, um, budgets were also redelegated many projects were either postponed or removed while making place for the digitalization process to come through. Entire schools and universities had to switch to online learning, homeschooling and remote access had to, to be given to many people all at once. Uh, this entire urgency sometimes led to uh, missing out some important configurations or lack of training for the staff members because there was uh, not enough time for it, which was also used as an attacking point. As we can see from uh, this slide here, there was a research done by Checkpoint and they're showing the increase of the cyber attacks, which happened right at the time of the first lockdown in uh, Europe, which was mid-March last year. As many people were worried, and afraid about the virus itself, bad actors had taken this fear as an advantage and used it also to send uh, phishing and spam emails. Just as an example, in a survey that Deloitte Research did, 
they found out that the increase of the phishing or spam emails was rounded to 25%. And in addition to that, there was uh, the 14% increase in concerns about data protection while uh, working at home. If this is not enough, in addition uh, uh, to the, the facts that uh, I have shown, uh, if somebody is wondering how big the impact of the COVID-19 related cyber attacks was, a scary fact is that, for example, US companies have lost around $654 billion uh, as a result of this effect. From a global point of view, at least 60% from the companies had been victims to these cyber attacks. Basically, identifying, managing, and resolving a cyber attack takes a lot of time and efforts, which leads to an operational freeze by the companies as it prevents them from focusing on their products and uh, services. As mentioned previously, this is all happening at the same time while we have the stress and fear in people which is caused by the situation. Implementing a combination of security solution does not solve the general problems as with the magic wand, unfortunately, because there is always the risk of the employees not receiving a proper training and an explanation about why a product must be used, uh, what kind of a prevention method does it represent. Therefore, one of the biggest risks that a company can have when it comes to using uh, security solutions is leaving uh, the employees on their own. So for many employees, it's not really uh, clear what the safety regulations mean. They're sometimes uh, written in a complicated language and they're far away from the regular communication that we have on a daily basis. So they're really hard to understand. And the easiest way to deal with them is just to go around them, to ignore them. More or less with the current work from home situation, uh, many employees are using the work laptops for their own private purposes as well. Uh, as a working parent, which has to deal with homeschooling as well, quickly checking up the info about um, what does something mean uh, while helping with the ho homework is not uh, unusual at all. I'm pretty sure that many have been already in uh, this uh, situation. However, without the proper training on data workflows and what is exactly classified as sensitive data, many employees might uh, be also saving directly files to the cloud without um, any protection being applied. A really important note here is that every cloud storage provider has uh, their own security measures, which are effective when used correctly. And they also encrypt the data which is stored on their servers. But the main point is that all of the encryption keys are also on their side in the cloud, which would technically give them the opportunity to either access or provide the access to authorities of the content that we save in the cloud. And therefore, having an additional layer of protection for your data by encrypting it locally with your own set of keys would give organizations back the control of their own data in the cloud and make the remote work um, easier and safer at the same time. So encryption is already available with many services that we use, but uh, it's a level, especially when it comes to, for example, basic encryption is not the same. And in most cases, it's uh, not enough. However, the combination of zero knowledge and end-to-end -end encryption is nowadays uh, already a necessity. So what do these two terms mean and what benefits do they uh, bring for us as the cloud users? So um, the idea of the zero knowledge is uh, when the uh, encryption provider doesn't have any chance to access your uh, data. At the same time, end-to-end -end encryption means that as soon as the data is encrypted locally, it's then synced to the cloud. So it travels and arrives in the cloud already protected. And the cloud provider, including any hackers or 
in some unfortunate event of a breach within the cloud storage account, can't see the content of your data. So that's end to end, the data being encrypted from, uh, from both sides. In addition to that, constant employee training and cybersecurity awareness is also really important as it turns out that many companies uh, do not have any training at all or any additional measures such as data encryption, endpoint protection or protection against web-based threats. So referring back to our own internal company usage, um, I can also say that we use our own product Boxcryptor on a daily basis within all of our departments. And whenever there are some new features or some changes, we get to see how everything works, not just to be able to explain the details to everyone that is interested in using it, but also to ensure our own clients that their data is being protected from our side. If the firewall seemed to be enough uh, protection back in the days, with the remote work, we don't uh, have the same level as everyone has a different setup on their home network. We also need to have in mind the technical capabilities of each employee, as not everyone needs to be as knowledgeable as an IT administrator in order to securely work from home. In fact, one of the top requirements when organizations are looking for an encryption solution is how easy it is to use a certain tool just because of the fact that uh, not everyone on the team has the same um, technical experience. And thanks to the cloud, we have a lot of opportunities to continue the same workflow at home that we had while working from the office. In most cases, all that is needed is just a device with an internet connection as almost all of the apps that we use are cloud-based. So there's not always the necessity to install something locally. With that said, an employee can be quite flexible and mobile with their work, literally being able to work from anywhere. But as we know, with great power comes great responsibility and therefore uh, comes the need to protect the data when uh, we all work remotely. No wonder that the cloud has kept its first place as a top digital priority in the last three years. And we can surely say, especially in 2020, when companies were literally forced to use the cloud due to the increase of remote working. The entire digitalization process was brought to a high speed, including for many organizations who never thought of using cloud apps for their daily work. Uh, and now they had to arrange the move uh, quickly. So in addition to various cloud apps, what's being used on a daily basis is the cloud storage or the place where we save the data that we work with. So anyone that uh, currently uses a cloud storage, would that be OneDrive, uh, SharePoint, Google Drive, Dropbox, or anything else can see the advantages that we have from it. It gives us a chance to collaborate on various files, regardless if we are accessing those files on um, our desktop machines or mobile devices, if we are, as we mentioned, in the office or as uh, currently we work from home. Then unlike this, the local storage on our devices, it's practically unlimited, as you can always get some more if needed, and that is done extreme, extremely fast compared to upgrading your local storage uh, as an example. With the cloud-only option, we also don't need to use our local storage space always, but instead we can download the data on demand and also have it as a backup option in case of a hardware failure. For example, caused by spilling out your hot coffee or tea over your laptop early in the morning. Furthermore, the integration of the cloud storage uh, as part of your app stack is really easy and cost effective as you don't have to worry about the amount of storage on your own hardware, which also leads to reducing your costs and time efforts. And the best part is that it's available immediately. You can create an account and voila, you can start uplo uploading and sharing data either internally with the team members or externally with uh, your project collaborators. 
what needs to be taken into consideration is that same as any other cloud app, it would require for you to have an internet connection so that you would uh, be able to upload files or work with your data. And since the, since the files are not hosted um, on your local servers, but in the cloud, uh, if the necessary security measures are not taken, there is always the risk of uh, third parties accessing your data. One thing to mention uh, here, which was um, also discussed on uh, other uh, keynotes today, uh, the shared responsibility model, which is available uh, with the cloud when it comes to security. This means that uh, the cloud already applies the measures that they consider to be effective, uh, but you also have to do that on your side as well. You can't rely uh, entirely on the cloud provider to keep the files uh, safe for you. With that said, having the best cloud protection won't really help you if you use account passwords like admin123, for example. So in this case, I would go back to what I've said in the beginning about the combination of zero knowledge and end-to-end -end encryption being a necessity nowadays. So companies must not have second thoughts about their data security and use zero knowledge and end-to-end -end encryption, not just to protect their own business and reputation, but also every client, partner, or service provider that they collaborate uh, with. In addition to uh, all of the uh, technical features that we have mentioned, there is also the legal compliance that uh, comes into play, such as the GDPR. Since uh, May 2018 for the EU and everyone else that works with personal data from EU citizens and companies. One good example uh, in this case would be, let's say, the HR team of literally every company or organization as they have to deal with ext extremely personal information and are obliged to protect it according to the uh, GDPR guidelines. Um, I have listed here the information that states in Article 32.1, where uh, it says the controller and the processor implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk. This means that whenever the cloud storage is used for uh, keeping sensitive personal data, the transfer of the data has to be protected. The access permissions have to be granted in such a way that only authorized people could access it. And in addition to this, this authorization also has to be done in a manner to confirm the actual identity of the user. As a summary, McAfee has gathered the top 10 cloud security issues that companies are facing. Among the top three are um, the problem of not knowing exactly which data is kept in the cloud, the data that is being uh, stolen from uh, cyber attacks, and also uh, not enough control of who can access uh, the data or a misconfiguration in the access permissions. What uh, these are all, uh, let's say, um, the, the, the technical part, what is happening, but what is not mentioned here, and it's also really important, is how hard is to change the status quo when it comes to dealing with um, security threats. Uh, so there are few, um, if I may say, dangerous categories of um, organizations, companies, or people, you name it, uh, who say either uh, we've always done it this way, which means that opening up for something new, for a change is hard to consider. Then there is also the, it won't ever happen to me type, which is similar to either I'm too small to be attacked or who knows me. And then the third uh, category is I don't have anything to hide or my data is not sensitive. So basically, even if you are a team of uh, three people, five people, it doesn't matter, and you work with uh, clients, you surely have data that needs to be protected that shouldn't 
uh, go out in public. Even if you don't think uh, that uh, you don't have anything to hide, simply the fact of knowing that you have been attacked or exposed is quite uh, damaging. One of the examples that I can think of is you're probably attending this event from the comfort of your home, same as me. And everything that is dear to you is probably around you, like family, pets, anything else that you have around you. And imagine the situation of somebody breaking into your own apartment or house, even if nothing was stolen, your own personal area was infiltrated and that leaves a bad feeling, a bad taste in the mouth. And therefore, thinking that there's nothing to hide or in, it won't ever happen to you might not be the best uh, strategy. So more or less, companies have to take these issues seriously and, uh, as mentioned already, provide a constant training of the employees on the correct way on how to work with sensitive data. For example, when uh, new tools have been um, implemented, they shouldn't be forgotten, but regularly reviewed to make sure that everything is operational and secure. Because the damages from a breach are not just financial, but they also affect the brand reputation, which is hard to recover in the face of the clients and partners that work with the affected organization. So uh, security monitoring has also be, has to be able to alert about any employee misbehavior and companies should regularly check their current systems against the latest threats, if they're able to handle them and also how fast can they get back to business after an attack. And last but not least, having your eyes open about the security measures that your suppliers are and partners are having is important as well. Otherwise, you might be also affected as uh, part of the chain. As one of the most popular collaboration uh, tools, uh, especially when it comes to uh, working from home, Microsoft Teams is being widely used by many organizations. And uh, therefore I can show quickly, how do we protect the data within our, our channels with uh, our own tool uh, box scripter. So the combination of zero knowledge and the end-to-end -end encryption comes by default with box scripter along with the fact that it's uh, easy to use and it doesn't require any special uh, knowledge for the end users. So we don't know the password that you set for your user account and therefore we have technically no chance to see what kind of uh, files, what kind of content do you encrypt with um, our software. The box scripter encrypts the data that you usually store in the cloud and it supports all the major cloud storage providers. Uh, just as an example, anything that you store on OneDrive, SharePoint, Google Drive, Dropbox, etc. And since recently, uh, Microsoft Teams as well. And our team is actively working on its further development. And what you currently uh, have available with our Microsoft Teams app will be expanded with additional uh, features in, in future. So perhaps I can stop the share uh, of my presentation and I can show you quickly how does it look uh, when we work with uh, Box Scripter. There we go. You can already see uh, my uh, Teams screen and uh, Box Scripter, as soon as it's being uh, installed uh, for your teams, you can directly use it to encrypt the data before you upload it um, to your channel. So you have Box Scripter available both uh, over here on the left side um, of the menu um, for your personal OneDrive. Here it is. And then it's also available uh, here on the right side as a tab directly for your uh, team channels. So when I want to uh, upload, to share a file with a team member, which is part of my team's channel, I can directly start a new conversation or reply to an uh, open conversation. Let's start with the new conversation. For example, here we see the box scripter icon. We click on it. And here's the place where we can choose the file that we want to uh, share uh, securely. 
So as you can see, we also note here that the files are encrypted before being uploaded. I will just take this uh, photo as an example. It's being encrypted, uploaded, and there it is. For example, we can write here is the photo. Perfect. Now we have it available in the channel. When we go here at the box scripter tab, here's the photo that I have just uh, uploaded. And as we can see from the status, it is also encrypted. Assuming that the members of my uh, team here in the channel have already access to the files, they will be able to open directly the file that I have uh, just shared with them. If not, they will be able to uh, request uh, access. So the app is currently available for public channels. And as the data in Teams is saved in a SharePoint location, you can also sync this from uh, this button here. You can also sync this uh, location on your device. So you would be able to see the encrypted data directly within your local Box Scripter client. Same as you would work directly with uh, uh, Box Scripter for your OneDrive or SharePoint data. So I won't go into showing too many uh, details as that's not uh, the entire point of the presentation today. But if you are looking for a, a way to uh, protect the data uh, in the cloud uh, with utilizing the combination of uh, zero knowledge and also end-to-end -end encryption, you can uh, contact me uh, directly. That was it from my side. So in case you've managed to stay up until this uh, point and you are uh, seeing this slide, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, in case you might have some questions or feedback that you would like to share, uh, please uh, let me know. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. Yes, I have a question for you. Um, after this interesting presentation, uh, you, you discuss two elements that are very, very educational for me. One of the key challenges for companies, I don't know about you know the segmentation of, of those companies, but I suppose it's affecting every single company. One of the key challenges is to actually know what data is on the cloud. It's, it, it's, I, mean, I mean by that to have an actual map of where the assets are. This is also affecting, you know, sensitive and protected data by regulatory regimes. Yes, so that's, exactly. one in, that's one interesting element. The other interesting element is that, you know, even if it is in the cloud, there is a shared responsibility to protect that. That has been, you know, highlighted by regulations in many countries and regions, for example, GDPR, as you, as you discussed before. So, Considering these two elements that are by itself a challenge, how are you with regards, how do you feel, I mean, with regards to what companies are doing, you know, uh, in order to address these two problems? Are they doing enough? Do you think there is, there is are, are they aware actually? Because, you know, if they don't even know where the data is, are they aware of the problem? Because if they are not, it's, it's, it's difficult to actually put a plan in place to address right. it. So what's, what are your thoughts on this? And if you could, could provide, based on your experience, some granularity about segments, for example, this is a super problem for SMEs, but this more under control for corporates, or corporates is more under control when they are heavy regulated, for example, you know, in the healthcare industry. So what are your thoughts on this? I would say that uh, more or less it depends uh, both on the size of the company and also what kind of, a, um, in, as you mentioned, in which industry are we um, talking about. So, for example, when we are talking about the smaller companies, uh, as you know, the decision making process uh, involves not too many people with them and Perhaps uh, we can say that uh, they are a little bit faster in um, 
finding out the solutions, testing them and implementing them. Uh, of course, uh, when it comes to the smaller organizations, we also have the, the problem with the budgets. If they already have enough um, funds to cover the cost in order to invest in um, different uh, security solutions. Then when it comes to, for example, uh, bigger companies, uh, corporations, or even um, international universities, uh, they, I would say they are pretty aware of what is happening and maybe some kind of an obstacle would be their own internal regulations. Like, as I mentioned, um, the decision-making process sometimes takes um, uh, quite a long time, for example, and it, at the bigger companies, we also have um, various teams which are involved. Uh, let's say uh, you always have to work with uh, procurement, which have their own uh, set of requirements, uh, totally different from the set of requirements that the actual team, which will use the solution has. So there, um, there are a lot of, um, sides of, uh, of this uh, problem, but uh, definitely I would say that uh, companies and people are already aware of uh, the need of securing the data. And uh, as we said, as I mentioned also in the presentation, sometimes there is a conflict between um, knowing and wanting. Yes, I know that it might be uh, the time for me to do something, but do I want to do something? As I said, when you think the way of uh, nobody knows me, I'm not that big, nobody's going to attack me, so why should I invest in um, this or that solution? So uh, I would say that uh, this mindset is, uh, is an obstacle that uh, we need, uh, we as a, a security provider need to, to cross. And of course, uh, together with uh, every other uh, cybersecurity organization out there, we are uh, trying to, to provide as much information as possible so that uh, companies would uh, actually start their projects. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, when it's already early uh, as a prevention method, instead of uh, just coming to uh, cybersecurity providers when it's um, too late after the damage has been done. Did you see after did you see after GDPR kick in uh, an increased interest in protecting the data? Because at the end of the day, we don't need to wait for the data breach. Right. The, the data a company is not liable for having a data breach, but it will be for its behavior until the moment and also after the data breach. So they have, you know, the obligation, they are obliged by law to protect the data. Yes. So did you see an increase, an Im important increase in awareness after GDPR kicking about this problem, the, about the, the, the need to Yes, so uh, this is a really good question. Uh, I can say that from our own experience, uh, perhaps a few months before uh, the GDPR kicked in and maybe in a time span of uh, one year after uh, it was already um, eligible, uh, there was a high interest uh, from companies um, either to inform themselves, like what are the opportunities uh, when they for example, would implement a solution like a box scripter on their side, or uh, directly starting with the, with the testing phase and then talking about implementation. And then after this first year, I would say that uh, the interest has come to a, a regular level, uh, something similar to what already was um, before and uh, we still do get uh, a lot of um, discussions uh, on daily basis when uh, we have uh, interest from uh, new companies who are looking at box crypto as an opportunity and they mentioned that uh, the gdpr uh, requirements are also a valid point uh, for them but the good thing is that 
this is not the main requirement. So uh, people realize that they already have a lot of sensitive data that they keep on their site. And uh, probably this is uh, also the, on the same, has the same level of importance as the legal side of the GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, sorry. Yes, no problem. Because uh, for example, if we uh, consider the, the budget restrictions by some companies, uh, it, it's definitely better to make the investment in a, in a tool that would help you protect uh, uh, you and the company instead of uh, having to face the, the damage after a breach, not just the financial, but also, as uh, I mentioned, the, reputation, the reputational damage afterwards. Mm -hmm. And touching upon awareness, do you have some views? As you know, both crypto is a global company, it's playing globally. Do you have some views you would like to share about, you know, the awareness uh, from a geo perspective? I mean, there is, do you see any difference? Because we were talking about GDPR, which is an European thing, not always because it's impacting everybody in the planet who is holding information or managing or processing information from European citizens, which is most of the companies in the world right now. Yeah. Uh, but do you have any thoughts about what's happening in Asia? Or for example, you know, where we are about to jump into the North American Latin session. Do you have any thoughts about Latin or North America about, in terms of awareness about the need to, to address this shared responsibility when uh, storing data uh, in the cloud? I would say that uh, uh, it depends uh, on the size of the company once again, and if they're dealing with uh, anybody from the uh, uh, European part, for example, if they are, mm -hmm. They're definitely aware of the need of um, protecting their data. They know about uh, GDPR as well as, for example, we are also familiar about other legislations like the CCPA, for example, in uh, America. And we follow what is happening uh, also in other parts uh, of the world uh, regarding all of the legislation. So we follow how for example, Australia is working on uh, on this uh, uh, thing. And a uh, few months ago, there were also um, a really high uh, level of talking uh, in uh, Brazil. So we definitely see that um, different countries are already reacting, uh, following the model that we have here in Europe from the GDPR. Uh, after understanding that uh, probably that's the, the right way to go. And more or less uh, uh, the legislation is, uh, is similar everywhere. So uh, I think that uh, the, the awareness is definitely rising as the, the time goes by on an international level. Okay, so that's enough from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Thank you as well for having me. My pleasure. With this, we finish the, 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 the EMEA track.